and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Good evening, listeners, and welcome to Season 8, Episode 5 of Horror Hill. Tonight's episode brings you a trifecta of titillating terror, with three stories that are guaranteed to chill your bones. We'll begin our evening with The Coal Miner's Ghost by Thomas M. Malaferina. In this story, we meet Henry who inherited his parents' house a number of years back. Though Henry has been working on updating the property, he hasn't been able to bring himself to uproot his father's old garden. The garden brings back complicated memories for Henry, and as he'll soon find out, some things are best left buried, both metaphorically and literally. Following that, we'll jump into The Well by Braden Hafechuk. This tale introduces us to Sheila and Matt, who have just moved into a new house in the country. During the home inspection, it's revealed that there's a hidden door that leads to a previously unknown basement with a strange well at the bottom. Also, I'd like to thank Olivia Steele for joining us in this story, playing the role of Sheila. Lastly, we'll finish up with The Ledge by Matt Martinek. I gotta tell you folks, this one is particularly unsettling, and I think it's best if you go in cold. All I'll say is that this story is not for the faint of heart. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast, bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today and get instant access. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. And now, from author Thomas M. Malaferina, I give you 
The Coal Miner's Ghost Henry looked out the window of his bedroom across the backyard to the place where his father's garden had once been. He recalled the garden from his childhood, back when the home where he now lived had belonged to his parents. Henry had inherited the house following their passing ten years earlier and made numerous changes to the property since taking possession. Still, he had always chosen to leave the garden as it was. If asked, he said he didn't know exactly why. It just felt like something he should leave alone. But in reality, Henry knew that wasn't exactly true, because he did know the real reason why. He simply preferred not to think about that reason. No matter how much the property changed due to his numerous improvements, one thing that could never change was his many memories of growing up in the house. Most of these childhood recollections were pleasing, precious, and endearing, but a few were haunting and even terrifying, such as the memories of the garden and that one horrifying night. His father's garden had been small but efficient and yielded plenty of vegetables for his family. He recalled how his father would painstakingly organize his garden exactly as he wanted. First, he would plant the tomatoes in evenly spaced rows and add an aisle or two of beans. At the end of each row, he would pound in stakes fashioned from old broomsticks and run a twine line between these makeshift poles. He would hang an assortment of old bottles and tin cans from the twine, clinking together and rattling in the breeze. The idea was to scare away wild creatures that might intend to steal from the garden, but the sound was often equally frightening to young children gifted with vivid imaginations. Whenever Henry heard decorative chimes clanging together on someone's front porch, he recalled those same sounds coming from his father's garden. Of course, those eerie sounds were not as pleasant or refined as expensive store-bought bells. In fact, at night, when the wind came blowing down off the mountain, rattling the bottles and cans, the sound was often so frightening as to send him and his siblings into hiding, trembling beneath their covers. It didn't help when his father would tease them by telling them that what made the sound was the ghost of an old coal miner tramping about his garden, looking to steal his tomatoes. On nights when he was feeling a bit more daring, Henry would crawl out from underneath his covers, walk in the darkness across his bedroom, and look out the window. He was always cautious not to make too much noise, not wanting to frighten away anyone or anything which might be lurking in his father's garden. On one particular evening, Henry would have sworn he saw that miner's ghost near the garden, preparing to enter and steal the vegetables. However, the clanging cans and bottles seemed to keep the specter at bay. That night, the ghost miner had raised his head, looked up at Henry's bedroom window and stared directly at the terrified boy with crimson eyes glowing beneath his dark coal miner's hat. On the front of the blackened cloth cap, Henry noticed a shiny round container appearing to have been made of metal. Inside the container, he saw a small flame. The ghost raised one withered hand and pointed up at Henry's window. He saw the creature open its almost toothless maw, and an ungodly sound spewed out of it, so horrifying that it sent ice right to the depths of Henry's soul. Terrified, he fled the window and raced back to his bed. He had never spoken of this to anyone and did his best to forget about it although that was impossible. Even all these years later, whenever someone blew across the open end of a bottle, Henry remembered the sounds made by the wind howling through that frightening garden, and then the miner's banshee bellow. Now, standing at that same window, he thought about that night 
and that miner's ghost. Had it been real? Had it been a dream? Had it been nothing more than a fantasy conjured in the dark from the vivid imagination of a creative young boy? At that time, it had seemed so very real to him. Year after year, the grass, weeds, and occasional vegetables had risen up from that 10 by 12 foot plot all summer, some growing as high as 4 feet tall. And every fall, they died, shriveled, and eventually rotted. His wife often chided him to do something about that former garden, but Henry always found an excuse for never getting around to taking care of it. Henry recognized that, in many ways, that abandoned plot of the earth was more like a graveyard than a garden. And if that was the case, then it was a graveyard for what, exactly? For ghosts? For the coal miner's ghost? An icy tremor raced down Henry's backbone at the thought. He knew such ideas were ridiculous. There were no such things as ghosts, no matter what the frightened child buried deep inside him wanted to believe. That place was just a plot of ground, nothing more. He realized his wife was probably right. Perhaps it was high time he should man up and do something about the only remaining eyesore on his now beautiful property. Later that day, Henry rented a rototiller at a local home supply store turning the soil and grinding up the decayed weeds, grass, plants, and leaves. It was a hot, dry summer day, and the sun was blazing in the sky. His wife had suggested he return the ground to its original purpose. She said she had been thinking about planting a vegetable garden for several years, so why not use that plot, since not only had it originally been a garden but also because it was likely packed with decades' worth of nutrients from rotting vegetation. At first, Henry didn't favor the proposal, probably because something deep inside him couldn't embrace the idea of having another garden. It felt like he was attempting to rekindle some fire that had burned out long ago. Or, perhaps worse, it was as if he was trying to raise someone or something from the dead. But that, too, he knew was ridiculous. He reluctantly agreed with his wife's proposal, but decided he wouldn't mention the idea of pounding broomsticks, stringing twine, or hanging bottles and cans. A garden might be one thing, but the idea of hearing those horrifying noises at night again was more than he cared to think about. He decided his wife could plant and put a fence around her garden. If some animals found their way inside, then so be it. Henry noticed something glimmering in the afternoon sun as he plowed through the garden, the rototiller sending mounds of shredded debris tossing and turning in a cyclone of flying, dusty soil. He shut off the tiller and examined what it might be. He gripped it tightly and began to pull it out of the newly turned earth. As he yanked the thing free... He realized it was some sort of half-cylindrical metal container. It looked like a tin can, sliced in two from top to bottom. At first, he thought it was the remains of a can, which his father had hung from the twine so many years earlier. But when he saw the remnants of a base and tattered wick, and then saw the black cloth attached to its back, he recognized it as what it had once been. It was what was left of a very old miner's lamp, which 19th century immigrant coal miners often mounted on the fronts of their cloth caps. Holding the thing, Henry was transfixed. In his mind, he was transported back to that day so many years ago, when, as a boy, he stood at the bedroom window, staring out into the glowing red eyes of the ghost miner with his filthy black cloth cap and his glowing miner's lamp mounted to the front. Was this the same cap he had convinced himself that he had only imagined? If so, what was it doing here? He had been a child in the 1950s, 
Miners hadn't worn those caps since the turn of the 20th century. That meant that if it were here, buried beneath this soil, someone had buried it much earlier, perhaps even before he was born. Then it suddenly hit him, and he realized that it had likely been planted many years earlier, back when his father was a boy, back when his grandfather owned the family homestead. What had his grandfather buried back here? Or perhaps better questions might be who and why. Henry glanced down again and saw something dry and yellowish white protruding up from the ground. He instantly recognized it as a bone, a human bone. He couldn't believe his eyes, but it was the skeletal remains of a human finger. His breath caught in his throat. What exactly was it that lay beneath the soil of this garden? Then, to his amazement, time seemed to slow as he stared down and saw the skeletal finger twitch ever so slightly. Soon, another bony finger poked its way out of the soil, followed by another, then another. Two moving, decomposed hands had emerged from the earth and grabbed tightly onto his ankles. Henry felt an icy chill race up from his lower legs and spread throughout his body, paralyzing him as he looked on helplessly in unimaginable terror. He could see traces of skin still clinging to the hands in some places, but the flesh was gray, mottled, and filthy. He saw yellow larvae crawling about the withered skin. Then, he began to feel the tug. Although dry and dusty, the soil around the skeletal hands had become loose like black sand, and Henry felt himself begin sinking down deeper into the soft earth. He tried to call out, but couldn't utter a sound. Soon, the hands were gone from view, and he felt the dirt against his waist. He commanded his arms to resist, move, to fight back, but he was helpless. Soon, the soil was up to his chin, then spilling over his lips and into his mouth. He could feel the tiny granules trickling down his throat like sand through an hourglass. When the soil reached an area under his eyes, he could no longer breathe. His terror grew as his lungs burned, screaming for air. Then, everything was blackness. By the time the ambulance arrived, Henry was dead. His wife happened to look out the kitchen window to see him collapse near the new garden he was preparing. The emergency medical technicians determined the cause of death to be either a heart attack or heat stroke. However, even with 30 years of combined service on the job, the EMTs had to admit they had never seen such a look of utter terror on the face of any such victim before. You've been listening to The Coal Miner's Ghost by Thomas M. Malafarina. And now, from author Braden Hafichuk, I present The Well. A bit of a lemon, isn't it? Sheila asked as she hefted the first box out of the moving van. A short, high chuckle responded to her question as she turned around to see Matt, her husband, striking a superhero pose with his fists at his waist while staring at their new home. Lemon is a car term, darling, he said. I don't think it quite applies to a house, especially not one with this much character. Sheila couldn't help but laugh. Character. Turning her back to the moving truck and looking up the brick steps and rolling lawn, Sheila felt a cold shock run down her spine as she gazed at Matt's latest investment. 
Sitting on the bump of land in the middle of this flat prairie stood Eckert Manor, a three-story Georgian manor with a faded black exterior and a profile far too thin for Sheila's liking. Look, I'm no fan of it either, Matt assured her as he placed his hand on her shoulder. But it's the only lot in this county cheap enough for our budget and also close enough to the office that I won't have to make any overnight trips. Besides, with the money I'll be making, we can knock this lemon over and build up whatever dream house your heart desires. Sheila felt her grimace disappear at Matt's words, and a smile fully replaced it as Matt grinned at her with the usual shit-eating grin and hefted the box out of her hands. I like that plan, especially the lack of nights away from me. She responded in her seductive tone that was always Matt's favorite. Don't you know it, baby? Matt turned around towards the house and began making his way up the stone steps, shaking his butt back at her with each step. Sheila laughed to herself, and her worries disappeared as she turned back into the moving van and grabbed the next box. I don't understand. The bank said we'd be insured for any property repairs by purchasing the home. Sitting across the table from Matt and engrossed with his calculations, the accountant shook his head without raising his eyes at Matt. That was a part of your contract, but there is a ceiling for the amount our firm will cover, Mr. Swan. Matt hunched over the table and ran his fingers through his hair as the thunder rumbled miles away. It was a good thing Sheila wasn't around to hear this right now, he thought. His wife had made the trip into town a few hours ago to consult their new doctor about a missed period. Even without a uterus in his body, Matt knew that stress was the last thing a potentially pregnant woman needed, which is why he told her he would handle the home inspector meeting himself, a meeting he was starting to realize was way beyond his own calming abilities. While the roof repairs, upstairs bathroom plumbing, and staircase termite damage have already exceeded our coverage amount, we should still continue the inspection further down the property, just so we can give you peace of mind on the state of your new home. Yeah, peace of mind, Matt muttered, lifting himself up from the kitchen table as the accountant gathered his paperwork. Your main floor, at least, seems to be in proper shape. Shall we continue to the basement? basement? The term made him forget about his worries and replaced them with confusion. The real estate agent didn't mention a basement, he answered. That's strange, said the accountant. These blueprints are over a century old, but they discuss a basement that should be accessible here. Matt watched as the well-dressed man circled his kitchen and approached a blank, black wall the couple had yet to decorate. The accountant inspected the wall for a few seconds, knocking his knuckles every few feet and listening for any sounds. Before Matt could ask the man what the hell he was doing, a swoosh filled his ears as a section of the wall swung in, causing a breeze of old, stale air to rush into the kitchen. There's been a secret door in this house the whole month we've been here? The accountant turned around to answer Matt's question a self-satisfied smile pushing his flabby cheeks against his thick black glasses. Quite so. You see, this county saw many skirmishes in the Civil War. To protect their families and belongings, the local well-to-do began refashioning their doorways into flat, undetailed wall panels they could hide behind during battles or raids. A proto-panic room, if you will. I can't tell if we overpaid or underpaid for this shack. Matt said, rising from the kitchen table and following the accountant as he descended the shadowy passage. After a few steps into the darkness, while clasping the railing, Matt heard the accountant scoff as he fumbled for a flashlight, and what he saw as the bank employee flipped the switch and illuminated the passage took his breath away. The staircase they stood on descended for what looked to be two or three stories, sticking to the walls and twisting with each angle as it sank deeper and deeper into the earth. The entire chamber was one large room that seemed to equal the size of the rest of the house, 
and at the bottom of those grimy and creaking stairs, a single object rested in the center of the chamber. A stone well, some six feet across. Careful on these steps, the railing may be our only saving grace. Who knows how long this room has remained unopened, the accountant muttered. Unopened? I thought this home had a previous owner? Matt asked, gripping the railing for dear life. It did. The Parson family mortgaged this property from the bank some ten years ago. They were good clients and paid their mortgage on time for a year until they stopped paying their bills one day, and all attempts to contact them failed. I came here to investigate what was happening and found the property completely empty. I guess some trouble with the locals caused them to pack up and leave. Never did find out where else they may have gone. The thunder, closer and louder, boomed outside as if to punctuate the ending of the banker's tale. By the time the accountant had finished his story, the pair had reached the bottom of the chamber and began approaching the well. Although he knew he was back on solid ground, Matt felt fear taking hold as he slowly placed his hands on the well. Peering over the ledge, Matt stared down the pit, but nothing, not even any water reflection from the accountant's flashlight, returned his gaze. Hmm, seems to have been long dried out. I can have a contractor come by tomorrow to chase the hole down if you like. See if there are any nests or gas leaks? No, it's fine, Matt sighed as he pulled away from the well. He would honestly have laughed at himself if he didn't have a multi-thousand dollar repair bill about to be dropped on him. Anything else you need to look at? Want to check my closet and charge me for the hanging bar not being level? The accountant laughed at the response while signing some documents by flashlight. No, Mr. Swan, that pretty much does it. Once we go back upstairs and I get your signature, I'll be out of your... Before the man could finish, thunder clapped so loud it sounded like a jet taking off, crashing against the house and shaking Matt to his bones. As he gathered his wits and steadied himself against the wall, Matt could feel water rushing against his feet, rising so quickly that it was halfway up his shins before the accountant realized the issue. Flash flood! The accountant yelled out putting that earlier fear back in Matt's spirit as both men raced back to the stairs, the sloshing of the water slowing their progress with each step. Matt was the first one to make it to the stairs, the accountant having stopped in his tracks to return to the well and grab his documents. Come on! he shouted, holding out his hands to hoist the bank worker up the stairs. The water was now up to where Matt's waist would have been, rising faster every second. The thunder was booming louder and louder, so loud that Matt couldn't even hear his own jumbled thoughts as he reached out blindly for the rail. The distant light of the kitchen far up the chamber wall was his only source of hope right now. Behind him, Matt heard a slam against the wooden steps. The accountant had tripped, and Matt saw, out of the corner of his eye, the flashlight turning end over end through the air before splashing into the water and plunging the pair into darkness. Matt turned his attention back up the stairs to the distant, dim light of the kitchen behind the secret door before racing as a child on the creaking steps towards it on all fours. The sloshing was only getting louder now, and Matt knew that even though they were halfway towards the top, the water was keeping up at a frightening pace. Another clap of thunder, this one as if an eye beam was smashing into the ground a foot away from Matt's ear, but that was the least of his fears. His heart sinking into his bowels, Matt watched the lights of the kitchen flicker and die, plunging him and the accountant into total darkness. I don't want to die! I don't want to die! Matt felt his bladder give way as warm urine poured down his leg. The bank manager wept behind him. Matt? Matt, where are you? The familiar voice of his wife restored his soul like nothing ever before. We're here! He screamed out as loud as he could. 
The water was now beneath his hands, but the small light of his wife's smartphone shone down on the pair. Before he could rise to his feet, Matt was knocked to his side against the stone wall and railing as the accountant barreled up past him and towards the small white light. The creaking of the wood step beneath him was the only warning for what came next. While the weight of one man earlier wasn't enough to break the centuries-old planks, the stress of two at once was far too much. The cracking of old wood and the sudden drop caused Matt's heart to skip, and the sudden shock of the cold water nearly killed him right then and there. As he rose to the pitch-black surface, Matt heard the flailing of the accountant beside him. Sheila, help us! Matt screamed out as cold, disgusting water poured into his mouth. I see you! I see you! She responded, flashing the light of her phone into his eyes like a sailor lost at sea. As he gathered his wits and could see slightly better than not at all, he saw the steps above the broken one and reached out, holding on for dear life but not climbing up so as not to risk breaking this one and dooming them for certain. With his body now stabilized, Matt felt and heard something he wasn't expecting the water level slowly lowering against his body. A great sucking noise grew so loud as to even eclipse the booming thunder. The well! The well must have gotten unclogged and was now draining the water. The rapid decrease of the water level was so great that Matt could feel his knees and legs on dry air, but the sudden grasping of the accountant's hands more than made up for the sense of danger. Don't leave me! He screamed, gripping Matt's legs so hard that he felt the man's nails slicing into his skin. Please! I can't swim! The accountant kept screaming as Matt held on for dear life. The sound of the draining water was still the loudest in the room, but Matt could now hear the plank he was gripping creak, and he knew it would break if he didn't lose the weight. Both men would be dead. Get off me! He screamed down, shaking his body as much as he could. The accountant fought for dear life against the shaking, but that would only kill them both. The buoyancy of the water was nearly gone from their legs, and both of them would soon be without any support below them. Matt wouldn't die, and he would do anything to make sure of it. Letting his right hand go from the plank, he reached down around his waist until he felt the bald, flabby head of the accountant, then the thick glasses frames, and then the man's eye socket. Matt drove his thumb in. It felt as if he were pushing his thumb into a cup of jello, an innocent image he focused on as he drove his thumb deeper and deeper. The screams of the accountant had changed from those of terror to those of unimaginable pain, but it was doing the job. Matt felt the other man's grip loosen before vanishing completely as the draining of the well overcame his screams. Matt and Sheila sat in their kitchen, neither of them saying anything. Sheila was sitting with her knees brought up to her chin. Matt rubbing his thumbs with a kitchen cloth in a daze, as he had done for hours since climbing out of the chamber. Do you think the water's cleared? Sheila asked, bringing Matt back to the present. The draining sound stopped a while ago. Must be at least below the surface of the well, he muttered. The two sat in silence for what felt like an eternity before the sun's rays returned to the kitchen. Dragging himself up, Matt walked over to Sheila and gently but firmly pulled her phone out of her hands before reopening the door to the basement. His phone had fallen into the water during their… escape, and hers was the only tool they had to discover the extent of the nightmare. He took a few shaky steps past the hidden door and onto the first few planks of the stairs, and Matt could see that he was right. The water level had fallen below the well's lip, and he could see the slimy walls and smashed pieces of wood from the broken steps. 
But it was what he didn't see that shocked Matt the most, that being the body of the accountant. No body, no torn clothing, no blood in the water. Even the papers that he had risked his life going back to the well for were nowhere to be seen. Matt felt his skin going cold, colder than it had been when thrashing around in the water a few hours ago. Slowly, he worked his way down the twisting stairs of the chamber, listening for any sign that another step would break under him, but none did. When he finally reached the base of the room, Matt crept through the water towards the well and stared down into the empty void as he had hours earlier. No water, no accountant, no nothing. Why was there nothing? Why was there even a well in this room? Who the hell builds a chamber this large? These questions, and a thousand more, poured into Matt's mind as the sheer horror of that gnawing emptiness cut up from the darkness and into his very being. He dragged himself back up the stairs, past Sheila in the kitchen without a word, and dropped himself on the love seat in the living room, his hands shaking as he reached for the pack of Captain Blacks on the coffee table. What are we going to do? Sheila asked as she came to the threshold between the rooms, but not crossing it. Matt was quiet for a few seconds as he lit the cigar and took a deep drag. The accountant came and left before the flash flood. The last we saw of him was him driving up the road and back to town. His keys are on the table. I'll drive the car up the road and leave it on the shoulder of the highway. Matt stated in a flat tone. And what about the basement? Close it up. We didn't notice that secret door after a month of living here, and I'm sure as shit that no visitor will figure it out either. Silence returned to the room as Sheila stood like a statue in the kitchen, and Matt lay like a corpse on the couch. I'm pregnant, Matt. Sheila announced with barely more than a whisper. Matt didn't respond as he exhaled a cloud of smoke. His mind couldn't do anything anymore. It was full of the terror of the water, the screams of the accountant, and the consuming horror of whatever waited within the darkness of the well. You've been listening to The Well by Braden Hafichuk. And now, for our final tale of the evening, I give you The Ledge by Matt Martinek. So what'll it be, sir? A simple enough question to most, but my mind races back to the hours before, to all that damned blood. I snap back and begin to debate between a cheeseburger and a chicken sandwich. It seems like a little beef in the tummy might settle me down a bit, and I choose accordingly. I attempt to slide my card, but hesitate, noticing a fleck of the red stuff on my sleeve. My eyes dart to the cashier. Does she see it as well? Is it even there at all? I think better of it and complete my purchase. I sit down to my meal amongst the dregs of society, all of us beaten down by this shit town we call home. What the fuck had just happened? And it was so fast. No choice, only action. My mind had woken up like a hungry bear in springtime. I begin to play back the day's events as I take my first bite. 
boring start to another boring day in the cage. I work as an inventory specialist, another title for a glorified parts counter. And yes, these expensive parts, for airplanes mainly, are locked up safely. Just me and the parts, caged in eight fucking hours a day. It does take some mental dexterity to deal with the loneliness of a day like that. You just do your time and go back to your normal family. Then, do it again, and again, and again. Until the end of time, it seems. A beast in a cage. Why should today be any different? I eat my shitty cereal, stuff myself into my button-down shirt, brush my middle-aged teeth, and off I go, straight up the highway. Early fall morning suns just starting to peek through the darkness. I'm half asleep, robot mode, until I see a figure perched on top of the side rail of McNally Bridge. Suicide Bridge is what we call it a quarter-mile-long overpass above a deep gulch amongst the trees. So deep it is, in fact, that you can differentiate the separation of the fog line as it settles from up above. Apparently, the bridge is hungry on this day. I automatically begin to slow as I see the hooded figure, all dressed in black, ready to descend. My heart is starting to beat faster as I imagine the body falling out of view, like a bird out of the sky. I creep closer, probably twenty feet away, until I park and turn my lights off. I think about driving away, as it is their ultimate decision to make, after all. The naive, childish part of me, however, simply will not allow for it. I open the door and slowly make my way to the figure. At about ten feet away, I hear a low female voice barely reach my ears. Just please mind your own damn business, or give me a push. Pick one. I retort quickly, if you're gonna do it, at least do it with good form, like a fucking diver or something. I'll rate your performance and tell the papers how you fared. I'm hoping some humor will diffuse the situation. For a moment, she turns her head towards me slightly and smirks. Quite the smartass, aren't you? Her response calms me a bit. I can do this. I can get her off that fucking bridge. Let me see your face, I ask. Why? What the hell does that have to do with anything? She seems perturbed. Because you sound sexy? Are you sexy? Cause if you're ugly, I guess I'll call it a day then. She giggles. I'm in. She flips back her black hood, and I'm able to see that I'm not far off from my initial assumption. Jet black hair, shoulder length, porcelain skin, and gorgeous blue eyes, as opposed to the ugliness of the streaked mascara running down her glistening cheeks, still wet from the tears probably in her mid-twenties, if I had to guess. Fit-looking. See? Now was that so hard? My name's John. What's yours? And don't tell me your last name's Walenda, or else I'll have to question your balance. I'm Ruth. Why the hell did you have to show up? I just want to do it. Let me go. I'm done. With everything. Sick of all the bullshit. She begins to wobble a bit as she starts to sob. I understand, completely. I've been there before. Life's hard, but we have to be harder. What if tomorrow ended up being the best day of your life? You would miss it. You don't want to miss it, do you? I want to get her down before we attract too much attention or the cops show up. Cars are slowly driving past hoping to catch a glimpse of the dive. Eventually, someone will fuck this up. I slowly approach the ledge. What are the odds of anything turning around ever? Every day gets worse. One shit sandwich after another. 
I can't fucking do it. I won't. Her voice cracks as she inches closer to the edge. Fuck. Let's just talk about it. What's that gonna hurt? I'm one hell of a good listener. Let me prove it. Please. After all, I'm missing work for this shit, and if you jump, it's gonna fucking traumatize me. I give the most boyish smile I can, and I outstretch my hand towards her. My heart speeds up as I realize this is the moment of truth. Ruth's eyes raise to mine, and the moment lasts forever, until she makes the move that will change everything for both of us. She grabs my hand, and I gently help her down from the ledge. With my heart in my throat, I clutch her tightly and take her to my car. We're both sobbing at this point, emotionally drained. What a fucking day, and it's not even 7.30 in the morning yet. We leave her car on the bridge, and I agree to drive her home. She's definitely in no shape to be operating a vehicle. As I drive, Ruth begins to let loose about her life and the reasons that brought her to rock bottom. She goes into the hatred within her family, the fact that her parents won't even talk to her, and confides in me that she's struggling with her past heroin addiction, which led to the loss of her job. I listen. I let her pour it all out. Sometimes that's all a person really needs. She's definitely been through the shit. She directs me to her home, about 15 minutes from where we met, down a few back roads near the county line. As we get to her house, she invites me in, because she says she doesn't want to be alone. Of course, why not? My work begins texting me, wondering where the hell I am. I turn off my phone and follow Ruth into her house. I notice how meager her lifestyle is. Simple, but very neat and tidy. It's a small house, but then again, it's all she really needs. She makes us both coffee, and I sit with her at the kitchen table. We continue our discussion about her life and run through some possible options and programs she could get into, a game plan for her life, etc. She has so much to live for, such a beautiful person. I enjoy spending time with her. In another life, maybe we could have even been an item, albeit with a slight age difference. Every now and then, our eyes lock, but she quickly turns away. There is an energy between us, one that cannot be ignored. Unfortunately, she has no idea who the fuck I really am, or what's about to happen. Sitting that close to such a beautiful girl... It's hard not to think of where I would start on her delicious body. I size her up as we're chatting. I know she won't put up much of a fight. I want to taste her. So badly. And I will. Eventually. When I saw that girl on the bridge, in the deepest recesses of my mind, all I saw was a weak victim easy for the plucking. An opportunity had presented itself, and I took it. Enter her life in the guise of an angel, only to introduce the devil when the time was right. It's such a nervous excitement right before you pounce on your prey. The feeling builds and builds until you can't hold it in any longer, and you finally explode past the point of no return. I can compare it to a sexual climax. The most pleasing thing, however, is the look of sheer surprise on their faces when they realize what you are and what's about to happen to them. The same with Ruth. The lunge across the table, the spilled coffee, the smashed cups, the feeling of my knees hitting the floor as my hands wrap around her neck. It is quite the event. I can see the fear and disbelief in her bulging eyes as I squeeze tighter and tighter, off and on burying my face in her hair so I can smell her scent. 
Choking the life out of someone is no easy thing, and it's not necessarily quick. It takes time and strength, but thankfully this is not my first rodeo. Patience is a virtue. You have to get past the gurgling, the flailing, the foul smell of piss as it exits their body and puddles around you. Sometimes, thankfully not in this case, they'll even shit themselves. And then, after minutes of struggling to breathe, they will give you the look. One of submission, of giving up. At this point, they accept their death. Only then does it become real. The flailing stops, and the silence is deafening. Ruth is a fighter, for sure, more than I had anticipated, but the end result is the same as all the rest. I kiss her forehead, slowly, enjoyably, right before I begin to disrobe the body. I partake of her treasures for about an hour, doing whatever I please, in any manner that suits me. Details are unnecessary at this point, as those are gifts set aside specifically for me to enjoy, no one else. After all, there exists decorum, even in murder. I take photos when I'm finished, a keepsake to behold for years to come. When the fun is over, there's only work to be done. I clean up all the coffee, pick up the porcelain shards, even mop up the mess Ruth had made from her panicked bladder. I bag it all up to bring with me, dispose of it elsewhere. That's the easy part, but what to do with the body? A part of me wants to take it with me, hide it in the basement maybe, but that's just fantasy. I already know in my mind that the easiest thing to do would be to continue what she had started. Her car was near the bridge, and onlookers can place her there. I have to get the body back where it belongs, on the rocks below. It is extremely difficult to put clothing back on a dead body. The dead weight's almost too much for me to handle, but after a while I get everything back in place perfectly. Unfortunately, I noticed blood beginning to dribble out of Ruth's mouth and nose, which was unexpected to say the least. I like things to be as clean as possible. I shove a dish towel into her mouth, maybe to help stop the flow. Thankfully, Ruth's house is a bit in the trees with no close neighbors, so moving her to the car shouldn't be an issue. I stoop down and lift her up, carrying her like a baby out through the screen door. 120 pounds might as well be 250. I struggle just to get her to the car. I dump her in the back seat and pull a large blanket from my trunk. I place it over her. At this point, I'm really sweating. Not just from the physical expenditure, but also because I'm becoming concerned. I'm beginning to realize how difficult it's going to be to get that body over that damned ledge in broad daylight. I begin to make my way back to the bridge. It's funny how paranoia takes hold when you've got a dead person under a blanket on your back seat. You drive carefully and slower than usual, always checking your rear view, always expecting those flashing lights. Time takes forever to pass in a situation like this. Eventually I near the bridge and I'm so nervous I could vomit. I park behind Ruth's vehicle and get out of the car. I survey the road. Thankfully, our vehicles are partially hidden behind a concrete barricade right beyond the ledge. I open the back door and start to prepare. I remove the blood-soaked rag from her mouth and throw it to the floorboards. It's a little before noon by now, and it seems traffic is slow enough to pull this off. With my heart exploding in my chest, I eventually see my chance. No traffic in either direction. I rip the blanket off and scoop up the body as quickly as I can. I stumble quickly to the ledge, my lungs burning, and with every ounce of strength I have left, I hurl the body over the side. I catch one 
last scent of her perfume as I let go. At this moment, I fondly remember tossing an egg from the windowsill as a child, just to see what would happen when it hit the ground. The body plummets in slow motion, it seems, with Ruth's beautiful black hair whipping in the wind. As she smashes back first into the rocks below, I can faintly hear a moist thud, like a wet washcloth falling into the tub. A large puddle of red forms underneath her, almost instantaneously. So much blood, more than I'd ever seen before. Her limbs are contorted, the bones obviously shattered. The head is now misshapen from the impact, almost alien-like, inhuman. It's a grisly image that will stay with me forever, I'm sure. I bolt back to the car just as I see traffic beginning to close in. It is done. I sip the last of my soda as the final memory of the day's events is completed in my mind. I relish in my accomplishment. It's not every day that an opportunity like that presents itself. I could have driven right past Ruth, let her do herself in, but that wouldn't have been nearly as much fun. I saved her life just to destroy it myself. The irony is not lost on me. It could have been anyone on the bridge at that particular moment, but it had to be me. Was it a gift? Possibly. Coincidence? Certainly not. And now, another notch on my belt. Another life snuffed out. Playtime for a beast. And to think, there's always another adventure to be had. You've been listening to The Ledge by Matt Martinek. Well, my friends, that closes out our broadcast evening. We don't often have a triple threat of stories on one episode, so I hope that you're all beyond stuffed with horror. If you somehow still need more, I'd recommend you check out the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast and YouTube channel, where you can find more stories of the depraved and the macabre. Thanks for coming by. And until next week, stay spooky. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, You can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. As for me personally, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, username VikingGuitar, and also on Instagram as VikingGuitarProductions. In particular, if you're looking for someone to provide voice work for your own project, or are in need of audio production of any sort, it would be wonderful to chat. Until next week, listener, 
when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Nikki McSorley and Eric Peabody. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave us a kind comment. Lastly, Don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling tales for dark.